I'm going to speak about corruption, but I would like to juxtapose two different things. One is the large global economy, the large globalized economy. And the other one is a small and very limited capacity of our traditional governments and their international institutions to govern, to shape this economy. Because it is this, this, uh, this asymmetry which um, creates basically failing governance. Failing governance in many areas, in the area of corruption, in the area of uh, destruction of the environment, in the area of exploitation of women and children, in the area of um, climate change, in all the areas in which we really need um, a capacity to reintroduce the primacy of politics into uh, the economy which is operating in a, in a worldwide um, arena. And I think corruption and the fight against corruption and the impact of corruption is probably one of the most interesting ways to illustrate what I mean with this failure of governance. Let me talk about my own experience. I used to work as uh, the director of the World Bank office in Nairobi for, uh, for East Africa. At that time, I noticed that corruption, that grand corruption, that systematic corruption was undermining everything we were trying to do. And therefore, I began to not only try to protect uh, the work of the World Bank, our own projects, our own programs against corruption. But in general, I thought we need a system to protect the people in this part of the world uh, from the ravages of corruption. And as soon as I started this work, I received a memorandum from the World Bank, from the legal department first, in which they said, you are not allowed to do this. You are meddling in the internal affairs of our partner countries. Uh, this is forbidden by the Charter of the World Bank, so I want you to stop uh, doing this. In the meantime, I was chairing donor meetings, for instance, in which the various donors, and many of them like to be uh, in Nairobi. It is true, it is one of the unsafest uh, cities of the world, but they like to be there because the other cities uh, are even less comfortable. And in these donor meetings, I noticed that many of the worst projects which were put forward by our clients, by the governments, by promoters, uh, many often representing the suppliers from the north, that the worst projects were realized first. Let me give you an example, a huge power project, $300 million uh, to be built smack into one of the most vulnerable and one of the most beautiful areas of uh, Western Kenya. And we all noticed immediately that this project had no economic benefits. It had no clients, nobody would buy the, the electricity there, nobody was interested in irrigation projects. To the contrary, we knew that this project would destroy the environment, it would destroy uh, riparian forests, which were the basis for the survival of uh, nomadic uh, groups, the Samburu and um, the Turkana in this area. So everybody knew this is a, not a useless project, this is an absolutely damaging, a terrible project, not to speak about the future indebtedness of the country for these hundreds of millions of dollars and the siphoning off uh, of the scarce resources of the economy from much more important activities like schools, like hospitals and so on. And yet, we all rejected this project. None of the donors was willing to have their name connected with it and it was the first project to be implemented. The good projects which we as donor community would take under our wings, they took years. You know, we had to do many studies and uh, very often they didn't succeed. But these bad projects which were absolutely damaging for the economy, for many generations, for the environment, for thousands of families who, who had to be resettled, they were suddenly put together by consortia of banks, of uh, supplier agencies, of um, insurance agencies like in Germany, Hermes and so on. And they came back very, very quickly driven by an unholy alliance between the um, powerful elites in, in the countries there and the suppliers from the north. 
Now, these suppliers were our big companies. They were the actors of this global market, which I mentioned in the beginning. They were the Siemenses of this world, coming from France, from the UK, from Japan, from Canada, from Germany. And they were systematically driven by systematic large-scale corruption. I mean, we are not talking about uh, $50,000 here or $100,000 there or $1 million there. No, we are talking about $10 million, $20 million on the Swiss bank accounts, on the bank accounts of Liechtenstein, of uh, uh, the presidents, the ministers, the high officials in the parastatal sectors. This was a reality which I saw, and not only one project like that, I saw, I would say, over the years I worked in Africa, I saw hundreds of projects like this. And so I became convinced that it is this systematic corruption which is perverting economic policy making in these countries, which is the main reason for the misery, for the poverty, for the conflicts, for the violence, for the desperation in many of these countries. I mean, that we have today more than a billion people below the absolute uh, poverty line, that we have more than a billion people without proper drinking water in the world, twice that number, um, two, more than two billion people without sanitation and so on, and the consequent illnesses of uh, mothers and children, uh, still uh, child mortality of uh, more than 10 million people every year, children dying before they are five years old. The cause of this is to a large extent grand corruption. Now, why did the World Bank not let me do this work? Uh, I found out afterwards, after I left under a big fight, the World Bank, the reason was that the members of the World Bank thought that foreign bribery was okay, including Germany. In Germany, foreign bribery was allowed. It was even tax deductible. No wonder that most of the most important international operators in Germany, but also in France, in the UK, in Scandinavia, everywhere, systematically bribed. Not all of them, but most of them. And uh, this is uh, the phenomenon which I call failing governance. Because when I then came to Germany and started this little NGO here in Berlin at the Villa Borsig, um, we uh, were told you cannot stop our German exporters from bribing because we will lose our contracts. We will lose to the French, we lose to the Swedes, we lose to the Japanese. And therefore, there was indeed a prisoner's dilemma, which made it very difficult for an individual company, an individual exporting country, to say, we are not going to continue this deadly, disastrous habit of uh, large companies to bribe. So this is what I mean with a failing governance structure, because even the powerful government, which we have in Germany comparatively, was not able to say, we will not allow our companies to bribe abroad. They needed help. And the large companies themselves had this uh, dilemma. Uh, many of them didn't want to bribe. Many of the German companies, for instance, believe that they are really uh, producing a high quality product at a good price, so they are very competitive. They are not as good in uh, bribing as uh, many of their international competitors are. But uh, they were not allowed to show their strengths because the world was um, eaten up by grand corruption. And uh, this is why I'm telling you this. Civil society ro rose uh, to the occasion. We had this small NGO, Transparency International. We began to think of an escape route from this prisoner's dilemma. And um, we developed concepts of collective action basically trying to bring various competitors together around the table, explaining to all of them how much it would be in their interest if they simultaneously would stop bribing. And uh, to make a long story short, we managed to eventually uh, get Germany to sign together with uh, the other OECD countries and a few other exporters in 1997, a convention under the auspices of the OECD which uh, obliged everybody to change their laws and criminalize foreign bribery. This is... Well, thank you. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, in doing this, we had to sit together 
with the companies. We had here in Berlin, on, in the Aspen Institute and on the Wannsee, we had sessions with about 20 captains of industry and we discussed with them uh, what to do about international bribery. In the first session, we had three sessions uh, over the course of two years. And uh, President von Weizsäcker, by the way, uh, chaired one of the sessions, the first one to, to take the fear away uh, from the um, entrepreneurs uh, who were not used to deal with uh, non-governmental organizations. And um, uh, in the first session, they all said, this is not bribery what we are doing. This is customary there. This is what uh, these other cultures demand. They even applaud it. Uh, in fact, Martin Walser still says this today. And so there are still a lot of people who are not convinced that you have to stop bribing. But in the second session, they admitted already that uh, they would never do this, what they are doing in these other countries uh, here in Germany or in the UK and so on. Cabinet ministers would admit this. And in the final session at the Aspen Institute, we had them all sign an open letter to uh, the Kohl government at the time, requesting that they participate in the OECD convention. And uh, this is, in my opinion, an example of soft power because we, we were able to convince them that they had to go with us. We had a longer term time perspective. We had a broader geographically, much wider um, uh, constituency we were trying to defend. And that's why the law has changed. That's why Siemens is now in the trouble they are in. And that's why MIN is in the trouble they are in. Uh, in some other countries, the OECD convention is not yet properly enforced. And again, civil society is breathing down the neck of the establishment. In London, for instance, where uh, BAE got away with a huge corruption case, uh, which the uh, serious fraud office tried to prosecute. Um, 100 million British pounds every year for 10 years to one particular official of one particular friendly country who then bought for 44 billion pounds uh, military equipment. This case, they are not prosecuting in the UK. Why? Because they consider this as uh, contrary to the security interest of the people of Great Britain. Civil society is pushing. Civil society is, is trying to, to get a solution to this problem uh, also in the UK and also in Japan, which is not properly enforcing and so on. In Germany, we are pushing the ratification of the UN Convention, which is a subsequent convention, where Germany is not ratifying. Why? Because uh, it would make it necessary to criminalize the corruption of deputies. In Germany, we have a system where you are not allowed to bribe a civil servant, but you are allowed to bribe a deputy. Uh, this is under German law allowed. And the members of our parliament don't want to change this. And this is why they can't sign the UN Convention Against Foreign Bribery, one of the very, very few countries which is preaching honesty and good governance everywhere in the world, but not able to ratify a convention which we managed to get on the books with about 160 countries all over the world. I see my time is ticking. Uh, let me just try to um, draw some conclusions what has happened. I mean, I believe that what we managed to achieve in fighting corruption, one can also achieve in other areas of failing governance. By now, the United Nations is totally on, on our side. The World Bank has turned from Saulus to Paulus um, under Wolfens, and they became, I would say, the strongest anti-corruption agency uh, of the world. Uh, most of the large companies are now totally convinced that they have to put in place very strong codices against uh, uh, bribery and so on. And this is possible because civil society joined the companies and joined the government in the analysis of the problem, in the development of remedies, in the implementation of reforms, and then later in the monitoring of reforms. Of course, if civil society organizations want to play that role, they have to grow into uh, this responsibility. Uh, not all civil society organizations are, are good. The Ku Klux Klan is, a, is an NGO. So we must be aware that uh, civil society has to shape up itself. They have to have a much more transparent financial uh, governance. They have to have a much more participatory uh, governance in many civil society organizations. We also need much more competence of civil society leaders. This is why we have set up uh, the governance school and the center for civil society here in Berlin, because we believe 
uh, most of our educational and research institutions in Germany and continental Europe in general do not focus enough yet on empowering civil society, training the leadership of civil society. But what I'm saying from my very practical experience, if uh, civil society does it right and, uh, and joins the other actors, uh, in particular governments, governments and um, their international institutions, but also large international actors, particularly those which have committed themselves to corporate social responsibility, then in this magical triangle between civil society, government and private sector, uh, there is a tremendous chance for all of us to create a better world. Thank you.